Okay, good evening um, and welcome to this uh, Merseyside Labour Left Alliance uh, talk and discussion uh, on uh, global warming, COVID and Labour's uh, Green New Deal. Uh, our speaker this evening is uh, Simon Parani, who has written extensively on this issue, particularly on the history of fossil fuels and indeed uh, socialist uh, analysis of this, of this issue. Um, I remember reading Simon's work on other topics um, um, more than 30 years ago now, so I'm very, um, very pleased and actually quite glad to, to have met him and, and so on, and I'm sure this will be a, an excellent talk and an, an excellent discussion. Um, if you would, um, if you would, if you would like to contribute to the discussion, you can do this by uh, either sending your name in on the chat room or uh, using um, there's a there's another system I think of uh, of getting hands uh, and so on um, uh, that you can click onto. Um, but if there are any uh, if there are any uh, issues on that, please send me a message and I will. Uh, Try and get you connected. Okay, so um, we will we will we'll begin now, and then we'll have uh, a discussion and uh, contributions afterwards. So uh, I'd just like to call in Simon, and uh, thank you, Simon. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Kevin, uh, for the introduction, and and thanks to Merseyside Labour Left Alliance for inviting me to talk. I'm going to try and uh, share some slides and. Uh, run through those um, and before I put them up I'll say that I'm going to cover a series of points about some pretty big uh, global issues that I, I'm sure uh, all of you uh, who are on this call have spent time uh, thinking about and I have too and uh, of course to, to go from those global issues to specifics uh, is part of what we want to do and but uh, forgive me for the way I do the presentation I, I want to put the global stuff out there and then I'll, I mean I'll, I'll mention some specifics obviously but please come into the discussion with the specifics that concern you and uh, then we can uh, focus on those now I'm going to try and press these buttons to uh, share the slides um, there we are uh, let's just do that um, that right is that good yes yeah okay fantastic all right so uh i'm going to talk about five points um climate change and why the international negotiations have failed i'm going to talk about the transition away from fossil fuels which we all i think know is necessary and the argument i'll put is that those fuels are consumed not so much by individuals but by and through technological systems and those systems in their turn are embedded in social and economic systems and all those systems will need to change so when we talk about a transition away from fossil fuels th that systemic transformation is uh, what we're talking about i'm going to refer to some lessons of uh, the history of uh, fossil fuels and uh, as kevin kindly mentioned I, I, i've published a book on this a couple of years ago uh, which is not a book uh, for academics or specialists, but hopefully uh, relevant to a wider readership. It's called Burning Up. You can look it up. And uh, then I'll talk about a bit about the uh, coronavirus pandemic and how that has changed the picture. And finally, I'll talk, uh, just make some comments about uh, Labour's Green New Deal. So uh, about the climate talks. Um, I've argued in uh, the book and at uh, presentations like this uh, that um, these talks amount to a failure of political elites on a grand scale and uh, the graph you've got in front of you uh, shows that I would argue. Um, the three bottom rows are coal, oil and gas consumption, then the yellow one is nuclear, hydro and renewables just about visible at the top. So you can see the way that fossil fuel use accounts for the vast majority and still accounts for the vast majority of commercial energy use, commercial energy consumption. And the red arrow shows the 1991 Rio conference where all the political leaders gathered and acknowledged uh, 
that climate change was a problem and that action had to be taken. And you can see the subsequent reaction of uh, the consumption process to uh, their deliberations and just how effective uh, they were in dealing with that uh, on the slide. Consumption went up and actually, particularly in the uh, 2000s, uh, with a brief pause with the, the 2008 economic crash, but particularly in the 2000s, that uh, increase actually accelerated. And uh, that's disastrous for reasons that uh, you are familiar with. Um, this slide, uh, again, looks at that gulf between uh, rhetoric and reality uh, from a different angle. So this is from uh, the uh, carbon uh, track, cli uh, sorry, climate action tracker um, website, which I'd strongly recommend. Uh, it's put up there by uh, scientists who spend a lot of time working this data out. And what it shows is the pledges and targets that were presented to the uh, conference in 2015 in Paris, uh, which was kind of hailed as a turning point in that they'd made these uh, voluntary pledges from the different governments to cut uh, greenhouse gas emissions. The yellow uh, it, it shows the way that things would have to go if uh, global warming was to be kept within two degrees uh, above pre-industrial levels and green uh, shows you where it would have the way it would have to go if it was going to be uh, if we were going to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. Now, obviously, uh, socialists and people uh, on this call who are active in labour and uh, social movements understand that those targets are set themselves by this international political process. Uh, we might not like it, uh, for sure. Uh, people uh, in a Bangladeshi fishing village or doing farming in large parts of the global south would regard even 1.5 degrees uh, warming as unacceptably high for their communities. So these figures, I'm not presenting these figures as, as kind of gospel, I'm just saying those are the ones that were mentioned in the talks. So coming back to this point about the talks being uh, a failure, um, which from some points of view sounds obvious, but is, is hotly contested. Um, and I think actually that contestation is, is part of the problem, because along with the talks, there's a whole discourse about how governments have got things under control and what the rest of us need to do is pressure those governments and so on and so on. Um, and what I would argue is that the talks have, on the one hand, generated that uh, discourse and on the other hand, um, created a situation where uh, the driving forces of, of capitalism, the driving forces of neoliberalism, uh, which was at its peak in a way, uh, really uh, getting going at the time of the Rio conference, those driving forces have always prevailed. And I, I don't think uh, that there's no concern in the political elite uh, about climate change, or there are not many people there that understand it. But what's happened is that that, uh, that logic of capitalist expansion has just won out again and again and again. And on this slide, just briefly looking at the history of that process, uh, I, I mentioned how that happened. So Rio, uh, no binding targets was the aim of the American delegation. Of course, this was just uh, in the midst of the collapse of the Soviet Union. America was emerging, the United States was emerging as the, the global superpower. They insisted there were to be no binding targets and that policy was adopted and kept to throughout supported by the way by Republicans and Democrats. Um, subsidies for fossil fuel production and consumption uh, really started to grow uh, from this point and by the 2000s had reached hundreds of billions of dollars per year on a global scale. So I mean it depends how you work the numbers out and that's also a, a subject of controversy but uh, huge subsidies poured into the existing um, industries and uh, at the same time, in terms of uh, energy policy, particularly in a lot of the countries outside the rich world, a lot of uh, the dogmas of neoliberalism being uh, the controlling narrative. So uh, did the politicians and uh, administrators and managers of uh, energy systems go back from the Rio conference and think about how to start um, combining the aims of providing people with the uh, resources they needed um, with uh, 
dealing with climate change? No, they didn't. Their heads were full of the ideas about uh, liberalization and uh, privatizing electricity systems, which were in vogue at that time. And likewise, markets were deemed by uh, the talks to be the way in which decarbonization would happen. There would be carbon markets where a price would be put on carbon. Uh, this completely failed. And that failure really came to a head at the Copenhagen conference of 2009. And so we ended up at Paris with these so-called nationally determined or voluntary contributions from the nations. Um, and they have been uh, spectacularly ineffective. So um, a, a gloomy picture, yes, but I think it's incumbent on us if we want to pretend that uh, labor movements and social movements are going to find a way, not pretend, but if we're going to claim to find, be trying to find a way to address this crisis, we have to uh, start by telling the truth about uh, how bad it is. And to me, one of the very big and exciting things that's happened in the past couple of years is that uh, a generation which, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, I'm certainly not part of, uh, there's a couple of generations uh, younger than mine have uh, really got a grip of this issue. I, I mean, much. I think there's some similarities actually between these school climate strikes uh, on the Fridays uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement. And one obvious um, similarity, which you can see in this photograph, no printed placards. These are people who've uh, thought about why they're going out. They've taken their own placards. They're going out and demonstrating with their own messages, having thought through exactly uh, what they're doing there. And uh, this looks good to me. And uh, I think the uh, things that have been said by Greta Thunberg, of course, is the young Swedish woman who started this off, are very pertinent because she's starting off by trying to address that enormous gap between uh, political rhetoric and reality. So I think that is a, a, a real reason for uh, some optimism. Okay, next point is about the transition away from fossil fuels. And uh, I, I'm sure you've all sat in meetings or many of you will have sat in meetings and talked about this. Uh, the take I want to uh, put to you is, as I mentioned, uh, about the systems that consume these fuels. So if we talk about UK energy use, for example, uh, this is a little out of date, but, uh, but when I uh, put this slide together uh, a couple of years ago, uh, 2.7 tonnes of oil equivalent per person. And of course, a lot of the, uh, if you read the reports and the documents, they often talk about consumption per person. Now, of course, e even a relatively comfortable citizen of the first world like me who drives a car, I don't consume anything like 2.7 tonnes of oil equivalent per year. It's the big uh, industrial systems, it's the electricity product, it's the whole process of electricity production. It's not just me driving my car, but the whole urban transport system of the London area that accounts for these big amounts of uh, consumption of fossil fuels. And so take the, so the big items in this country are uh, transport, um, electricity, and home heating. And take the home heating. I mean, for millions and millions of citizens, um, that they have little control over how much uh, they use for home heating. Uh, in order to control it, you'd have to uh, retrofit the houses with um, heat pumps and other non-fossil fuel equipment. You'd have to uh, insulate them properly, which is zero carbon homes are now, uh, that's first year of architecture degree, it's pretty simple, um, but you've got to put money into it. And I, I saw an item, somebody, uh, one of the climate scientists mentioned on Twitter, uh, Boris Johnson has just decided to spend all this money on infrastructure, billions and billions of pounds. How much for home retrofitting? Zero. Um, so, but the point is, get, getting away from Boris Johnson, that it's systems, these, so, these technological and social and economic systems that uh, consume uh, fossil fuels. We'll leave that slide. That's just another uh, slide to emphasize this point. So, uh, take the top line. So the primary energy is specialists write about is oil that goes into the refinery, petrol comes out, but you know, petrol is only useful for getting from place to place. You then have to put it in the car that becomes useful energy. And what you want is to get from place to place. And if you uh, replace those urban transport systems based on cars with ones that put much more emphasis on other ways of getting around public transport, um, cycling and walking and scootering, whatever, 
uh, you then reduce the consumption at the end, but you also push back through the whole system and reduce consumption. And, and that's a large part of the answer, uh, in my view, of the problem of greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, moving on to uh, the history uh, part of it. Uh, and, and you're getting this from me just because uh, that's the subject I, I, I've specialized in and uh, studied. Um, those systems have a history. So taking again, uh, I, I put one on there about plastics and we could talk about the petrochemicals industry, the industrialization of food and the food manufacturer, the supply chains, the substitution of plastics for other types of packaging. Uh, where did all the glass uh, beer bottles, milk bottles go, the expansion of throwaway culture. So when you talk about the huge amount of plastics that are produced, you've got to think about those whole uh, chains. But let's focus for now on, on cars. And of course, uh, cars was the, uh, really in one, in one way, one of the prime and first consumer products for mass consumption that were produced by American capitalism during its rise after the First World War. And uh, I'm sure many of you know uh, the story. Uh, the 1920s, mass production techniques and new forms of labor discipline that were associated with those automated production lines are brought in uh, firstly by Ford and then by others. Uh, they create this consumer product. And a lot of the techniques we now recognize in modern day consumerism originate in the American car industry at that time. So the idea of planned obsolescence that uh, you know, you've got to buy a new one every year. That was invented by General, General Motors during the Great Depression to try to get the car sales up again. Uh, the enormous lobbying power of the car industry was relevant. The, the big three, uh, Ford, Chrysler and General Motors had fantastic uh, political power in uh, the States uh, in the 1920s and uh, drove the trolley buses off the roads in terms of urban transport and uh, undermined the railways as a form of intercity uh, transport. Uh, then in the, again, uh, I'm, I'm trying to do a big overview um, in a short time. So then if you go to the post-war period, uh, the post-war boom, uh, America expands and the idea of suburbia uh, comes into uh, our society, which hadn't really been there before. Spread out um, uh, dwellings, uh, perhaps as part of the grand bargain that was struck between uh, American capital and American labor, uh, comfortable spread out places to live. Uh, it's a two Ford garage uh, for uh, American families. And you can see the car households then in the boom period, uh, the car owning households, there's actually more of those than home, own, home owning households uh, in the United States. And in fact, there's then a whole, so uh, it's in the post-war boom that uh, car ownership becomes very common in other parts of the rich world, including the UK, and uh, that then spreads to parts of uh, the uh, world outside the rich world in the 1980s. And then uh, back in the home of the car in, in the States, you get this huge battle between the car companies and the regulators about fuel efficiency. And basically that argument by the turn of the millennium is settled by the car companies by selling people SUVs as opposed to cars to get around uh, those regulations. So it's technological systems embedded in social and economic systems that consume the fuels. And I offer this as an alternative view to what's a very prevalent narrative about population and population growth being the cause of this uh, fuel consumption. Of course, it's not irrelevant, but uh, what these graphs show very, very clearly is that the relationship between the number of people and the amount of fossil fuels that are getting cons consumed is very indirect. And to take the left-hand side, which is the country which now consumes more fossil fuels than any other, which is China, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor there, so that uh, where consumption of fossil fuels energy use goes up very, very rapidly there um, in the 2000s, that's obviously nothing to do with uh, population which carries on going up at a steady rate and everything to do with the industrial boom in China and China uh, becoming the so-called uh, workshop of the world. Um, the other aspect of um, 
the, the other disconnect between the number of people and the amount of fossil fuels that's consumed is that some people consume an awful lot more than others and some countries consume an awful lot more than others and that's tied up of course with uh, forms of economic neocolonialism and this is just a very uh, dramatic example of that this is Nigeria and this shows for 1971 in the uh, on the left hand side the middle 1991 and then 2011 it shows two things it shows on the, the left hand column the green the mostly green ones are Nigeria's own uh, domestic energy use and the reason they're mostly green is because that's the category that the International Energy Agency calls in its statistics hydro and other renewables and in Nigeria's case more than 90% of that is firewood, brushwood, animal dung, stuff that the Nigerians in their tens of millions collect from the countryside and it's almost always the women and girls in families in the countryside in Africa who go and collect this stuff for burning uh, to produce light heat and for cooking. Now what you can see is that the oil which is exported from Nigeria, its energy content has always been right through this period greater than the total energy that Nigeria and its 200 million people use. Uh, the, and uh, you can see the small amount of oil it consumes itself, the grey at the top. Most of the oil is exported and it's exported to the rich world to feed um, the capitalist economy uh, in the rich world in the main. Um, so let's move on to the uh, fourth point, which is about uh, COVID-19. <clears throat> Just before I get on to the... Uh, specific things about COVID-19, I think it's made me think about two things. It's a, it, 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 it's a, a shocking interruption to our lives, uh, not like anything certainly that I've uh, ever experienced. And I think that shock has reminded me that the way our society operates, the type of economies and the type of governments that we have, the type of relationship with nature that's implicit, not particularly in uh, this Chinese wet market where it's believed the outbreak started, but just the whole way that uh, in agriculture and industrial agriculture in particular sits on the edge of uh, provoking nature uh, with all sorts of practices. Um, it shows how uh, a phenomenon that's arisen in our increasingly alienated and, and messed up relationship with the national, uh, natural world has can come back and bite us with uh, extraordinary uh, ferocity and how uh, governments have the capacity, first of all, to leave citizens to fend for themselves, which is something I think people in the global south are very, uh, have been very, very used to for a very long time. But I think uh, for us who've been brought up in a, a country where we've always had a, a labor movement, we have a welfare state and so on and so on, uh, that's been a shocking, uh, sight to see. Um, and the other thing is the way that governments, uh, having told us they can't mobilize resources for anything due to the neoliberal ideology, can with incredible speed mobilize the resources which completely put the bank bailout of 2008 to 9 in the shade, just vast uh, financial resources uh, in order to protect their priorities, which of course, uh, uh, as you're aware, in, in the case of this government, very much the economy and it sees society only through that uh, prism of the economy. Um, but so going on to the specifics, um, what the uh, pandemic has also shown us is, is the way that you can have a sudden um, interruption to uh, transport more than anything. So in terms of fossil fuel consumption, the fuel that's really been hit is oil. And the reason it's been hit is because uh, uh, as you know, planes and trains and uh, buses simply stopped. And this incredible chart that was in the FT in April, it's a bit out of date now, but I mean, it, it shows you London in the last week of March and the fraction of traffic that was on the roads, Paris as well, Wuhan, uh, the third one on the left-hand column, and the pink bits are, are where uh, the, the, the amount of traffic uh, that was running and the gray bits behind are the sort of traffic you would normally expect on those days uh, at that time of year, the historical average, absolutely staggering reduction. Um, and of course, aviation uh, reduced uh, even more so. So um, 
I think we've we've seen uh, the way the, 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 the those dramatic impacts, and I mean, there's a whole story about the oil industry, and it's basically encouraged the big companies to think about swallowing uh, the small companies. But really, um, the the economy having uh, taken that huge blow, and uh, the aviation industry, you know, probably the best example, having taken that blow, uh, what we're now seeing is the way that governments are seeking to come back. Um, the evidence from China is, is not pretty. They have uh, approved more uh, new coal-fired power stations to be built uh, in the last couple of months in China than they did in the whole of 2019. Um, and uh, you know, governments will, will follow the logic of uh, economic expansion. And I think we're seeing the same thing in the sort of proposals that have, we're now seeing in the US and the UK. And uh, well, uh, Carbon Brief, another very good website, what they made out of this is that uh, we're likely to have 5% um, less greenhouse gas emissions this year after this huge disruption. But what we need in order to get to that, going back to that 1.5 degree target, what we need is even more than that every year in this decade um, if uh, dangerous global warming uh, is to be avoided. So again, um, I'm, I'm actually not a gloomy person and uh, I, I'm, you know, in my kind of life philosophy, an optimist, uh, but I think you have to stare reality in the face and reality is tough. And so when people uh, um, think Extinction Rebellion has been going on these demos and saying no going back, and I think no going back, and that's also come up, I think, in, in the political sphere, um, and what they mean is no going back to the economy in the way it was before, um, I think that's a very real question. And of course, the, the, the big challenge is, you know, how do we combine not going back to uh, the sort of economy we had before with uh, our aims of social justice, um, of uh, social equality, um, and of a, a, a life that's really worth living. Uh, and so having said that, I'll try and move on to... Um, my questions about the Green New Deal. So this is the last part of this and uh, start by saying that the Labour conference resolution in September will, so th there are a lot of different versions of the Green New Deal. Right now there's the American one, there's the European one, uh, there is the UK Labour Party one and certainly the conference resolution from September was perhaps one of the strongest statements of intent by a large political party that um, climate change and the issues of uh, decarbonisation must be integrated right into policy. And uh, you know, congratulations to all the activists who went around and did all the resolutions and elbowed uh, out of the way uh, the union leaders who didn't uh, want to go down that way and got that resolution passed by a thumping great majority uh, in Brighton. Um, and I think that, you know, that changed the agenda just in the way that the, the school students and the, uh, so on have changed the agenda generally on, on climate change and, and uh, sharpened up the discussion. Um, however, um, this slide shows you some of the questions that I think were still unanswered uh, after the uh, Labour Party conference. Um, so electricity generation, uh, as I understand standing Labour Party policy, it's to, um, is to nationalise the network, uh, but not the supply, the so-called last mile to the uh, consumer's home, or generation. And the argument was that we, you know, we would support, we would get state support for wind and for uh, other renewables and out Fox or out compete uh, the big uh, energy generators in the market. I, I, I mean, we can have the discussion in questions if anybody's interested to ask questions. I just kind of have my doubt that, uh, you know, big companies are that easy to out Fox. So I think there's a problem there uh, and how to fund renewables investment is part of it. There was unclarity uh, coming out of the conference in Brighton about whether support for nuclear power generation is green. Again, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you things that uh, many of you are completely aware of. This is an issue that, that splits the labor movement. Uh, there are big trade unions who think that jobs in nuclear power make it worth it. Um, I think the arguments against that are, are just immensely powerful. Um, 
little said uh, at the conference or, or, or generally uh, about uh, the so-called just transition away from uh, oil in the North Sea. That is now starting to change. Uh, there is a discussion going on about that. I have to say it's not a lot of thanks to the big unions that have membership on the North Sea, but there is a just transition commission has been set up by the Scottish government. We, we've just completed uh, with a, a, a small NGO that monitors the oil industry called Platform London. We've just completed a submission to that commission. And to me, one of the most interesting things was that Platform teamed up with some uh, oil workers and put a survey about the industry on these Facebook groups and other social media where oil workers gather and chat to each other. And of course, there's been a lot of redundancies um, over the last few months because of the sharp decline in the price of oil. Uh, people feeling their jobs are very unstable. They just got a huge, a huge, majority, uh, I think nearly 90% of the respondents, these surveys, who are all oil workers, you have to fill in saying whether you actually work in the industry or the supply chain. And of those who worked in the industry, a massive 80 plus percent majority saying, we are ready to train, retrain, we'd love to work on offshore wind, uh, we think we can retrain, we've got the, the sort of skills, we, we, we would need some additional training. And even uh, then, they, they, there was a, a question, you know, which sort of retraining would you want? And, and, you know, a lot of support for renewals. I think it's a great, uh, just a little window into, uh, you know, what could be done. No, nobody ever asked the coal miners that uh, in the 1980s. Would you be willing to have good jobs in, a, in, a, in another industry? Um, so the oil workers have been asked, not by the government, but by a small NGO, but you've got to start somewhere. Um, okay, so a couple more uh, points about uh, the, the Green New Deal, really on transport. Um, I mean, I, 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 I've mentioned that. Um, so I've said that moving to a post-fossil fuel society, in my view, means a transition, a transformation of energy systems of technological systems social and economic systems and in transport this is very clear it is not simply about uh, having electric cars which if you get your electricity from gas which a lot of uk electricity still is you're not really winning on uh, greenhouse gas emissions by having everybody drive an electric car rather than a uh, car with an inter internal combustion engine but you are winning if you change your cities it's not rocket science. It's like Barcelona or Amsterdam. It has been done before. You create cities where people are better able to move around uh, without a car than they are with a car. And my example is uh, London, very relevant. This is getting to the end. Um, the, uh, we've been having a massive battle with the Labour controlled uh, Greater London Authority. Um, about a, they want to build another tunnel crossing under the River Thames, not far from where I live. And we've just done a report uh, with the uh, Transport uh, Action Network uh, and uh, other campaign groups. We've got a thing called Stop the Silvertown Tunnel. We, want, we, we, we don't like this tunnel. We don't think it's a good way of spending 1.2 billion pounds. Uh, but the uh, way, but the, the connection with climate change is here on this slide. So the Tyndall Centre at Manchester, um, it, it, they have worked out the speed at which every local authority, and it's worth you know, doing it for Merseyside, I know they've done it in Manchester, where there's a great uh, group that follows all this stuff. Um, the, the, the Tyndall Centre have worked out what needs to be done in every UK local authority uh, to reduce emissions. And the blue line is their graph for where it goes between, you know, over the next 50 years or thir no, next 30 years, pardon me, up to 2050. The orange line is, are the predictions, the kind of projections that are in the London Environment Strategy, which is put together by the Mayor's Office, uh, the Greater London Authority, but worse still, showing that they don't even really take their own targets seriously, the actual operational uh, numbers that the, uh, the staff at Transport for London, who are responsible for traffic, are working with is the purple line. Now, that's not funny right? That is in a world of wildfires, of record temperatures in Siberia and so on, and of the Greater London Authority claiming to be one of the leading uh, cities on climate change, they haven't worked out how to bridge that gap. Uh, the people at TfL are happily carrying along uh, with a very, very slow reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, 
they are ignoring what the Tyndall Center is telling them about the speed at which they have to go. Now we've seen uh, the catastrophe of this government ignoring uh, medical specialists uh, in terms of COVID-19. Uh, it's, it's dangerous to ignore climate scientists um, on uh, climate change. So final uh, two thoughts. Uh, the first is that uh, uh, I would just say generally I've, I've, uh, I, I, I've been involved in the labor movement uh, all my life. I edited the Miners Union Journal at one stage and been involved in all sorts of movements uh, before and since. Um, I think, I, th so this is my comment as, uh, as somebody within, I think the labor movement needs to become much more savvy about technologies and technology policy. We really need to understand, uh, am I right that electric vehicles are really part of the problem and not part of the solution, or is that wrong? What about uh, carbon capture and storage in hydrogen, which is now a big thing uh, in Yorkshire and the Northeast, it's being touted as a solution to home heating. I'm not keen, but, uh, but that's me. I mean, we all need to become more conversant with these uh, issues um, because otherwise techno fixes can be used to um, persuade us to continue uh, with the economy as it is. And the second thing is that while these big global problems are frightening, I think that we can't expect to some, uh, somebody to just come along with a global solution and it's actually going to be a fight uh, one issue at the time, perhaps our campaign here about Silvertown Tunnel is one example, uh, many other issues, many other examples uh, up in Lancashire, the fantastic people who have uh, taken such a great stand there against fracking being another, and I think it's a question of joining up all these uh, fights. So uh, that's enough from me as the introduction, uh, there's a bit of advertising, and uh, I'll um, stop sharing, which I think means we'll be all able to see each other, and thank you very much. And thank you, Simon. Um, I've got uh, I've got a couple of hands uh, raised, so I'll call them in. Uh, but before I do that, uh, someone on the question and answer has asked you a question, Simon. It's from Joseph Bilton, and um, I don't know if you can see it, but I'll just read it out so everybody can see it. Um, Methane hydrate poses a serious threat, and yeah. given recent findings, would Simon agree? cannot wait until another general election before bringing in deep sweeping changes. So uh, maybe yep. Simon would like to uh, consider that one. Do you, do, you, do you want me to go straight away or do you want to take the other questions, you know, a couple at a time? Up no, to you. I'll, 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 um, I'll take, uh, once I can find the, the various... Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll, I can tell you uh, what I know about methane hydrates, and that'll be quite short. Uh, I think what you're referring to is this effect where, um, as I understand it, it's particularly in, uh, in uh, Siberia, for example, but not only there, in areas where there's uh, permafrost particularly, uh, the changes in the climate, one of the ways they can accelerate, I mean, I'm sure you've done this as I have, I'm not a climate scientist, but when you listen to these people speaking and, and you know if you haven't get on the YouTube and find Kevin Anderson at Manchester for example uh, or Corinne Leclerc at uh, uh, University of East Anglia I mean th these are people who uh, are, are ready to tell us what they know and if you listen to these people speaking I mean, one of the scary things uh, several scary things Antarctica is a scary thing this clathrates thing methane clathrates is a scary thing and it's where uh, the changes in climate already in progress um, there's some fear among scientists that that will release very large amounts of uh, methane that are um, that, that are sitting under the permafrost in particular and that that then you know it's a it's a kind of feedback loop and a very vicious one now uh, there's a lot of scientific papers on this my understanding is that the consensus is that they don't know and I'm, one of the problems I find with climate scientists I think they should come out and say that more often because you know they really don't know about a lot of this stuff. They don't know, but I mean, what you have to emphasize is they don't know whether it's going to be bad or really bad or absolutely catastrophic. It's in a range starting with bad. And really the whole argument about these 1.5 and two degree targets and everything is about, can we keep it to bad and not get any worse? 
Um, and there is a range of uncertainty. That's the way the climate works. Um, and uh, there's a few, they all argue amongst themselves as well about is that the right way to present it to the public? Isn't that going to be too complicated and everything? I always think the public is vastly underestimated. The public aren't stupid. We've seen the same things with coronavirus. People know what the risks are broadly and uh, they're willing to listen to specialists who can tell them and that's the same with climate change. Um, so the answer is that's one of the uh, feedbacks, one of the dangers and one of the reasons why when Greta Thunberg says, you know, you've got 10 years to sort this out, we've got to remember she's, she's not exaggerating. Uh, she's, she's listening to the scientists. Okay, thank you, Simon. Uh, I think I have uh, a comment uh, from uh, Alan Gibson. Uh, question from Alan. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I would indeed recommend uh, Simon's book, Burning Up. Um, I found it very uh, informative um, about how um, we got to what I think Ian Angus calls fossil fuel capitalism. Um, you may call it that yourself, Simon. Um, I have one specific question and then more a general comment um, about nuclear power, Simon. Um, certainly, the, I think there are many problems with uh, the existing nuclear power infrastructure, um, but what is your opinion about the potential for fourth generation thorium based reactors, uh, which capitalism seems to show very little interest in. A mm -hmm. um, couple of points. Um, I can agree to some extent that the school climate crisis and strikes and Extinction Rebellion have changed the narrative or the agenda. But I was um, an active member here where I live in Cork in Ireland in Extinction Rebellion. And the reality is, is that they, that change is very limited. Um, and it's similar to the question of the Green New Deals, because yes, there are different versions of it, but they all share something which the school climate strikes and Extinction Rebellion also share, uh, which is that do, they do not challenge the logic of capitalism. They are appeals to the capitalist rulers um, either moral appeals or threats of direct action and disruption in the case of Extinction Rebellion. Um, but they don't challenge the logic of capitalism. As it, and as you rightly um, pointed out at the beginning, um, international capitalism has known about this for a very long time. Um, and they've had these international conferences. I think the new COP is COP 26 or 27 is going to be in Glasgow. Yeah. Um, and they have failed to do anything, as your, one of your initial slides pointed out. And that's not um, an accident of policy. Um, it's not, uh, it's inbuilt, I think, into the nature of capitalism. <clears throat> you referred to the uh, belief in infinite growth. Um, certainly any idea of a just transition um, is incompatible with capitalism because that's based around um, exploitation and uh, the daily theft we know is profit and massive capital accumulation, which has led to a world of obscene um, differences in income between the vast majority and the tiny 0.0001% or whatever it actually is who uh, make the big decisions in our world. So I, I think that that problem of um, capitalism have to be, has to be dealt with because a perspective which is kind of what I thought you were presenting was to have these struggles around particular campaigns um, within capitalism to try and push the policy further, I think is problematic. I think that that would be problematic in best of times because of the nature of capitalism, but we're not living in best of times. We're about to enter a period of historic um, downturn. Um, people will have seen, if they're following the news, references to when the money runs out, when the special COVID payments run out, when the evictions start, when the layoffs start, there's going to be a massive downturn, massive austerity. And capitalism, international capitalism will not respond in a rational manner because they're driven by short-term profit considerations. They're driven by defense of their capital. And that's a major problem. I'm interested in how you, whether you think 
that it is possible to mitigate the climate change effects which are already locked in, let alone whether it's possible to avert the catastrophe of four or five degrees, which makes human life effectively impossible. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank thanks, you. Alan. And um, just one more is um, Romy Chaffer, I think, as well, had, had a question. Um, that must be my mistake. Fascinating. I'm very interested, but I didn't have a question. Okay, thank you very much, Romy. Um, okay, uh, Andrew Ward, I think, had a question. Uh, okay, comrades. Um, the big question, hang on. The big question I want to look at is obviously, like, uh, you know, one thing we, I think we need to look at, we have the link with the, we, we have the whole, you know, new green, new deal with that, you know, renew, I was in new renewables, about ending the arms trade and linking, you know, the ending the arms trade, you know, for, like from an arms to renewable strategy. I think that's the only way forward. I think, you know, a socialist, surely. And also what material we use things like, you know, um, wind turbines or whatever we, we make as far as, you know, the apparatus to create renewable energy, you know, to allow renewable energy to come through, it has to be, but it can't become from extraction. It's got to come from, surely, it's got to come from recycled materials. And also, another thing we need to look at is things like um, hemp oil, rather than, you know, phosph you know there's, there's sort of things, you know, we, I think it's, it's about time the left looks outside the box a bit, being honest. I mean, the Green New Deal thing was a start. But I think we have to go further than that now. I think we have to look at the idea of, you know, things in the home, you know, like things, you know, wind, wind turbines and stuff like that. It's you know, not wind turbines. I'm talking about, you know, water turbines, water mills, and even something's in the garden, you know, or little, little, little wind turbines on top of a rooftop. There's something I think we could be looking at. Even if people are into cycling, they could actually, you know, doing keep fit at home, you know, they can be linked in and turning energy. We have to look at the different strategies. I think, you know, the Green New Deal's a start, but I think it's it's still the combined opinions of capitalism still. I still think it is, you know, I mean, you know there's, there's that danger. And I, I do think, you know, it's a foundation to build on, but it's not a be an end all. And I do think, I, I, I want to see what, what comrades actually think about, you know, what my ideas have come across. Anyway, I think I've said enough. <laughs> Okay, uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, Hello. Thank you, Andrew. Would you uh, like to reply to some of the questions, Simon? Yep, sure. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much. Um, so uh, I think in, in, in response to Alan, um, I, uh, I, well, uh, if, you'd, if, you'd asked me, if you'd asked me 40 years ago, I would have been reassuringly sure, not only that, capitalism was the problem, but I also would have had a, a set of formulas to deal with that problem. Um, and I would, have, uh, I would have bent your ear for you know, a long time uh, trying to convince you that my formulas were correct. Um, I, I'm, I must say I'm now uh, unsure about how uh, we get past or over uh, or get rid of capitalism. That is something that certainly uh, keeps me up at night and uh, it, you know it it, uh, it worries me and uh, I don't know the answer to it um, the uh, I, well I mean we've seen for example the tragedy uh, in Syria in recent years uh, where people uh, opposed the government are arguably uh, seeking democracy, seeking a better life. I mean, they not only ended up with the, the extreme militarization of the country with just unbelievable number of weapons uh, being brought into it uh, from all sides, um, but with an unparalleled level of violence. And when you uh, think about, you know, the example we all uh, turn to and 
which that it was something I, I researched and actually did my PhD on the Russian Revolution. I mean, the amount of violence, which was considerable during the Civil War and so on, is nothing compared to the sort of violence, and, and Syria is only one example, but there are other examples of governments. Uh, is the, uh, we, we've seen the uh, war in Yemen, which is ongoing. We've seen, you know, many, many other examples. I just, I, I really struggle with the ideas I used to have about, you know, how uh, we, we would be able to get past capitalism. And that to me is just an open question. Um, and uh, that, so the point that where I think I completely agree with you, Alan, and uh, uh, it, it, it's a point I should have really made in uh, the introduction is that um, it's clear to me that the scale of change that's necessary cannot be combined with um, ideas of uh, economic growth uh, under capitalism. I think this is the, this is the uh, issue we have to confront right now. So if we take the consultation that's going on in the Labour Party about the Green New Deal, obviously this has been headed up by Ed Miliband, who's extremely conversant with these issues. He's one of a group of MPs. We've got another one uh, locally here, uh, Matt Pennycook, who's on the front bench. These are not particularly left-wing people, but they do uh, understand climate change and, and some of the uh, dynamics. But it's just extraordinary and, uh, you know, puts the... Uh, Great London Authority in the tunnel in the shade to read that uh, Ed Miliband's reaction to the bankruptcy of Virgin is well, yes, you know, if Labour was is in charge, we would also uh, bail out Virgin, provided it became green. I mean, there is no way that anyone who understands the technology knows of uh, of running a green airline. You know, airlines air, air travel is one of the very hardest things uh, to decarbonize, and uh, that's a problem. Instead of saying that, Ed Miliband's talking about uh, bailing out uh, Virgin. So I mean, that's just one little example of where you get to if you try to combine uh, the so-called Green New Deal with economic growth. So I mean, I do think, and I think in labor movement terms, I, as I said, I, I've uh, long been involved in the labor movement. I'm familiar with the debates and so on. I think the conception, which is kind of pretty, I'd say it's pretty current, that to talk about degrowth and so on is is simply a thing for sort of environmentalists who aren't really part of uh, the labor movement and so on. I, I, I think it's completely wrong. And certainly my, so going back to the thing of how do we go past capitalism and what does post-capitalism mean, a transition beyond capitalism? I mean, to me, it completely uh, is tied up uh, in a way that Alan and uh, Andrew both spoke about with um, ideas of completely transforming the economy away from this conception of economic expansion and growth. I think the labor movement historically, I think, has been dominated by productivism. I think there are also historical reasons for that. But I think one of the one of the starting points to me is we have to say that's wrong. And we have to say that there's a lot of uh, uh, ideas that come out of that whole discussion uh, uh, about degrowth, which are relevant to our visions of a future, uh, which is past capitalism. And I mean, to try to to, uh, to wrap that up in an, in, in an anecdote, I think somebody who put this over incredibly well, uh, we, we had the climate camp here over in Blackheath, very near to where I live. It was 10 years ago, 2009, 11 years ago, uh, and they decided to have the climate camp. And it was this big tent full of a thousand young people. And they were having this discussion, do we need to get past capitalism in order to deal with uh, climate change and as a guy uh, at Leeds University David Harvey not the famous geographer David Harvey in the mm. States there's another David Harvey it's H-A-R-V-I-E and David was on the platform and some guy sort of got up and said look we've got to tell all those people uh, in China and all these other countries they've got to have less how else are we going to tackle climate change and David was fantastic I could never have done this I'm not such a good performer in public as he is and he said he said i'm gonna go to china i'm not gonna tell those people to have less i'm gonna tell them to have more and you could hear there was like from all these young people there was a kind of uh intake of breath there was a shock in the in the tent and he said um but he said the thing is more of what it's not more of sitting in traffic jams in these ludicrous 
mobile metal armchairs that everybody in the rich world has got, which is the foundation of parts of the so-called economy, it's more of a good life. And that is attainable without driving around in mobile metal armchairs and doing all the things we do, which look incredibly good for the GDP figures, but are not actually good for human life. So, I mean, I do think it's combining those, you know, asking ourselves, what is a good life? That to me is what socialism is all about. How do we live better? How do we have better cities? I mean, it wouldn't be hard to have better than uh, the sort of traffic jam infested cities uh, we uh, have to drag our children or grandchildren around in now. Uh, we could do so much better. And that to me is what uh, socialism is about. So combining the potentials of technology, combining what we mean by a good life with ending the kind of profit motive and everything else. Uh, as I say, how we get there, I'm slightly more confused than I was probably 40 years ago. Um, and I, I just the other point, uh, just to end to say in response to Andrew, I think a lot of the ideas you talked about alternative technologies and so on um, are absolutely uh, valid and actually part of this discussion, uh, whether it's uh, windmills, water mills, and uh, you know, there are many millions of ideas and uh, each one of them has to be looked at but it's a way, the way to look at them. We need to ask ourselves who controls the technology, what's it for, who's it being used for? And I think we need to change our attitude to technology. I'd strongly recommend the Center for Alternative Technology based in uh, North Wales. They've been working on this for 20 years. I mean, they've got a plan which they, says, they say adds up for the whole British economy, um, uh, which would entirely use these alternative technologies. So there are people thinking about this stuff and I, 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 I suppose I think the thing is, I think that the labor movement needs to take more notice of them. Okay, thank you, Simon. Uh, a number of people have uh, put up their hands. Um, so uh, I, I think it's Romy Chaffer again has uh, put up the hand. So do you want to come in now, Romy? Romy? Can you? Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yeah. I'm having a lot of technological problems. I haven't had this problem with Zoom before. Um, I haven't raised my hand. Sorry, you haven't raised your hand. <laughs> right. I, I'd like to, um, if you could just speak a little bit more about nuclear power, because um, I'm terrified of it and I'm and, um, I'm very terrified of uh, climate change, but um, I want my uh, grandchildren to have a safer future without, if possible, without nuclear power. Have you got any more to say about that? Okay, um, Marie Lynham, I think now. Hello, Marie, have you got a question? Marie, can you switch on your camera? And Mark as well, please. Should we do Mark first? Yeah, yeah, go, go ahead, Mark. Hello, uh, hello, Simon. Uh, one of the uh, great benefits of doing Zoom meetings is you can actually uh, consult your own library. And so I was just looking at some of the, uh, the miners from 84, 85 uh, in particular, and uh, the first issue of the Yorkshire Minor Strike uh, magazine, which came out, uh, listed all the things that people were fighting for, but also significantly listed that was the one for more research and investment in the modern ways of using coal, combined heat and power schemes, fluidized bed combustion, liquefaction and gasification. So uh, I think you were just a little but uh, to bit condemn the miners, the, the miners themselves were always looking for new ways uh, to use technology to make coal cleaner in essence. And as we know in 84, uh, the British coal industry was in advance of anywhere else in terms of uh, carbon capture and storage. And whilst we, uh, whilst we'd be happy for no coal to be burned. The fact is large quantities of coal are still being burned. And when I uh, interviewed 
uh, Bill Arons, who is the uh, TC Regional Secretary prior to the general election in 2017 and asked him what would be first on the agenda for the TUC locally if Labour was elected. He was quite clear. He said our first demand would be for carbon capture and storage in order to protect 28,000 jobs, which would be essential to it. And then there were other former coal miners, of which the most best known is Dave Douglas, who would argue that, in fact, uh, the coal mines should be reopened. Uh, Dave, at one point during that election, was actually going to speak on a platform with Nigel Farage, and I actually had to tell him that I would kill him, both of them, to be <laughs> fair, if that Dave did speak on the platform. And uh, Dave's a brave lad, but he's not that stupid. So <laughs> he decided he wouldn't go to the event. The question I'm sort of asking, in a way, is that coal is being burnt and will continue to be burnt. And I had this discussion with people, friends in the earth in particular, who said that, you know, we should not be arguing for carbon capture and storage. And I'm not entirely convinced that's the case, uh, that we shouldn't be arguing for that. Uh, well, I'm, I, I just feel that it's an interesting discussion. One thing I do think about the Green Deal is that for some reason, the word green didn't combine itself with agriculture and agriculture is one of the great greenhouse gases uh, in particular but in particular it didn't involve an argument which i've pushed forward for many years that there should be far more far more food grown in this country so large numbers of food which is imported and flown all over the world could easily be grown locally and that could be combined with the creation of many, many jobs. We calculated in our book, which I mentioned before, Bittersweet Brexit, that if the subsidy for land, which was coming from the common agricultural policy, went towards labour, you could create 300,000 land-based jobs, which were subsidised at £10,000, same as land is currently subsidised. And those are just a small uh, number of points. I'd like to go back briefly for then. I can remember in 1995, somebody coming to speak at the Colin Roach Centre talking about the environment. And I, like many others, I guess, at the time said, well, I don't understand what the environment has got to do with the Labour movement. So you live and learn, as they would say. I thought your talk was very good and raised a lot of points. Thanks for it. Cheers. Thank you. OK, thanks, Mark. Uh... Mary uh, Lynam, are you here? Oh, hi, Mary. Hello, Kevin. Hello, everybody. Thank you. This is a lovely discussion. Um, if I understood well the introduction by Simon, um, we are dealing there not just with private people doing, not doing enough cycling or not doing enough growing in their back garden, but with entrenched and absolutely decisive interests inside the capitalist system, which are decisive for the whole of us. And we don't have the power at the moment to transform that situation. Therefore, um, I think it's a matter there. I don't have any more answers than what Simon said. He says, well, I do not see how we can do that exactly. And I would say the same, <laughs> you know, I do not know. But it seems to me that the first thing that we can do is to highlight the class nature of this problem. It's not a technical problem. It's not a matter of finding new technical problems, new technical solutions. It is um, entrenched into the property relations and who owns what and who has the power to keep hold of it. And uh, obviously this is going to be a big job because if somebody mentioned, if we do, um, if we do tackle anything uh, of, of importance, you get a tremendous reaction against you. I forgot how we got to, I got to that. But, but the question of if you touch their, um, their interest at the centers, first we need the power to do it. And well, the experience of Corbyn has shown how, um, uh, how deep this problem is. 
and then you you find that they react the reaction is is not a sensible one i think it was simon who said that they don't react in a sensible way they don't have um, a logical a logical answer because the only motive is the interest of just a few people but nevertheless they have the power and so they do not react in a logical way and i, I don't think we should expect them to um, I think it's Simon who mentioned the situation in Syria, which was very interesting, uh, because this sort of devastation, absolute um, uh, wars which resemble nuclear wars more than conventional wars. Um, we, we are dealing with um, a situation where those who are sitting on the power, which allows them to continue uh, to, to the, the, the capitalist exploitation, those people are preparing already uh, for us. They are preparing. They see the mobilization of the young, the mobilization of the, of the school children, which is a very profound thing. And they realize that in the families of those young people and children, there, are, there is a climate of opinion which is not limited to the children. It is developing in the population an understanding that one has to intervene. And so that frightens the big powers and they react militarily. Uh, I, would, I would think that perhaps, perhaps more uh, uh, apposite than the Syrian example is um, the, um, uh, the Defender, Defender Europe 2020 and the Defender Pacific 2020, which are two immense military deployments throughout Europe and the Pacific against China and Russia, with I don't know how many bases, and they are in fact equipped with military weapons. And what they achieved this time was to deploy military weapons. Not only just they were carrying them in the planes, they are under the ground in five countries of Europe. And now this is not a small thing, but I think it is the, the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the bottom of what we are discussing, there is a, a conflagration that is being prepared in which we are not going to be able to tackle climate change separately from the question of social transformation. And just to a final point about Miliband, Miliband and the Labour Party, they are pragmatists. They think that capitalism has always been and will always be, and it's a matter of gradual transformation. So if we put enough of policies which are supposedly green, <laughs> if we actually accumulate these, we are going to eventually get to a green economy. And this is a very vulgar political level, I must say. <laughs> and I congratulate the comrades here who have spoken, and I don't have any better to say than they have. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Mary. Um, Simon, would you like to uh, come back? Yeah. I've got a number of um, I've got a number of written questions as well, but what I think I'll do is I'll let you come back for those and then okay. I present some of the written questions. Thank, thanks, uh, thanks, Kevin. Thanks very much. Um, so, yeah, just about the military. Um, when I, I wrote my book, which covers uh, fossil fuel consumption from the middle of the 20th century onwards, I tried to just, uh, I've got a chapter which is completely unreadable, I have to say, uh, <laughs> where I've got all the figures. It's good for reference. And I tried to do it in numbers because I think, you know, we need to learn to work with numbers and to know, you know, not just that something's big, but like how big and how big compared to other things. And it, it, most of the countries in the world produce no stats at all, no statistics at all about the use uh, of fossil fuels by the military. The one that does, ironically, is the one that probably uses the most of all, which is the United States of America. And uh, the Department of the US Department of Defense is the single biggest uh, entity in terms of consumption of uh, fossil fuels in the world. I mean, the amount of diesel, uh, I can't remember it now. I mean, it, it's just the figures are astronomical. And the Department of Defense consumes more fossil fuels th than the whole of Nigeria. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a big number, um, and it, it's uh, it, it's not seen. It's cloaked in secrecy, like a lot of other things. In the case of almost all uh, other countries, and I do think uh, these are linked <coughs> problems. I do think that's part of the 
unsustainability of capitalism uh, that we're talking about. Um, moving on, nuclear power, and I'm sorry to Alan who did raise this problem before. Um, like many of you, I, I grew, my process of growing up was about arguing with my dad. And my dad was a physicist, uh, and he was a great believer in uh, thorium, uh, it, which you mentioned, uh, Alan, um, as a way to solve problems. He was very aware of, of, of climate change and so on. He, and he uh, thought that um, nuclear power was a big part of the way that the world could find its way out of this. And I always argued with him. I was influenced by uh, the sort of environmentalism of the 19. 70s and 80s, which was that, uh, you know, which focused on nuclear power as something that was completely tied uh, to the military, which, I mean, he completely accepted. Um, I, and in the university where he worked, the, his colleagues were completely split between those who would be prepared to advise the Ministry of Defence and, and those like him who, who, who was not and who was involved with campaign for nuclear disarmament and so on. Uh, but he did think that peaceful nuclear was part of the answer. And it does indeed produce an awful lot of electricity without any greenhouse gas emissions. But I think that for our generation now and for future generations, it's always going to be a question of priorities. It's always going to be a question of choice. I mean, what's actually happening? They're putting these crazy sums uh, into Hinkley uh, C. Uh, they've guaranteed uh, a, a price of it, of, uh, for ele the electricity you know, far, far higher. I mean, they talk about the market and they say, oh, you know, the renewables have got to compete, compete in the market. But Hinkley C doesn't uh, would not have to, under the current deal, compete in the market. It's subsidised uh, by the state to an absolutely insane uh, degree. So, I, I mean, to put things crudely, I would say that if I was in charge, you know, first you do your, uh, you reduce your consumption. That doesn't mean you and I, you know, switching the light off and sitting in the dark or still less people getting cold in their homes. That is not what that's about. It's about, as I said, with the urban transport, changing the systems. Uh, so that less uh, energy is energy input, fuel input is required in the first place. You patch the homes up so that you're not putting, uh, you're not using energy to heat homes when they could perfectly well do without heating for most days of the year, uh, were they properly insulated and so on and so on. And, you know, you could go through a range mm -hmm. of examples. You don't, you know, produce petrochemicals at Grangemouth uh, to produce plastics to wrap things in which could do without that wrapping and so on and so on so you have to change uh, systems right um, then you when you've done that you uh, up your uh, at the same time you up your renewables you you, you have to uh, use your, your renewables I take the point Andrew's made you can't uh, we can't have renewable technologies that rely on looting people's countries for the minerals that are needed and technologies have to be found uh, that don't need that but you know windmills are not new right uh, there are technologies and they can be improved. Engineers are, are clever people. They can uh, develop these things. It's, it's again, it's a question of who are they developing for? What use are they developing them for? So you develop your technology, you reduce your demand uh, by changing your systems. You, you uh, re introduce your technologies. I'm not going to sit here and say that, it, you know, when my grandson's generation are in charge, if they decide that they can only plug some gap with a bit of nuclear, that that is... Uh, uh, forbidden as a matter of principle, it's not my problem anyway, it's going to be their generation's problem. But from where we're standing, uh, I'd say nuclear is not the answer. I mean, you can get a lot of, you can get a lot of electricity out of renewables. Um, and you can get, a, and you can dispense with the need for a lot of uh, fossil fuel use uh, by making the changes in consumption, which are anyway, uh, things we'd want to, 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 to live a better life. So I think that's the way we have to see it. Um, coal you're absolutely right mark that uh, the miners union did come up with uh, all sorts of things all sorts of ways that coal could be uh, used uh, and so on um, i think we you know we have to be clear that the argument in the 1980s uh, there's a really pernicious uh, sort of trend among right-wing environmentalists and conservative uh, party people um, uh, to uh, rewrite history and say that Mrs. Thatcher was the first environmentalist and she understood, I mean, she did understand climate change. She had a chemistry degree, fair enough. But the dispute in the 1980s was about a state attempt to crush 
to mining communities for political reasons. That's what it was about. And I, I was uh, involved at, at the time in the labor movement. I'm sure many of you were. And I am absolutely happy uh, that I went on those marches uh, shouting uh, coal not dole and so on. Um, but you know what's also clear looking back, I mean, no one ever presented in, in, in line with the Tory policy, which was to destroy and avenge, uh, to, to wreak vengeance on those communities for what they'd done to the Tories in the early 70s, in line with that policy, there was nothing, nobody ever mentioned. I mean, it, 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 you know, Mark, you live in a mining community and, and you'll know as well as I do, nobody goes down a dirty, dangerous black hole in the ground to work because they want to because they've got some kind of choice. They do it because that's the community they live in and that's the culture and the work uh, uh, culture that they've grown up with. And no, no kind of serious choice was ever presented to people. And we're going to have the same thing on the North Sea unless there's a, a, a change. People are gonna be thrown out of jobs uh, onto the dole uh, instead of uh, retrained uh, and so on and so on. So, um, I think now we have to say um, the uh, I, I think now we have to say that I mean certainly in this country, but I mean I would say generally I think globally, if you look at those graphs from the Tyndall Center, you look at uh, what needs to be done in terms of climate change. I mean coal has to be on its way out. That doesn't mean you know I don't want anybody to suffer. I'm never going to uh, you know argue for that or, or campaign for that or pressurized for that. But I also know that for my grandchildren's generation, both in this country and all over the world, to have a kind of stab at uh, some kind of reasonable existence, I mean, coal has to go, right? So uh, the problem with uh, carbon capture and storage, which uh, you mentioned, Mark, um, what is it doing? It's basically, it's burning coal, it's putting the carbon into the atmosphere, and then it's finding a clever way to take it out again. First of all, you've got to put it somewhere. And according to the engineers, that's an incredible problem. I mean, the whole basis of this scheme that's now been thought up, which is not for coal, but for gas uh, in Leeds, for converting the gas into hydrogen, is that they're gonna put it into old oil fields under the North Sea. But what if you don't live, first of all, I don't, I'm not even sure that's gonna work and nor are they. But secondly, what if you don't live bang next door to an old oil field? I mean, this is not a technology which gets us out of this. It really isn't. And I think the, championing, I, I mean, I was extremely disappointed and angry to see the leaders of Unison, Prospect, and two other unions, GMB, I think it was, and one other, I can't remember, uh, four union leaders, you'll find it online, have signed a, a, a letter supporting this new organization, uh, Hydrogen, we were talking about it in the Zoom call with people in Leeds the other day, let's have a look, Hydrogen Strategy Now, which is a complete, it's an employer's organization to boost this hydrogen thing, it's a survival strategy for the oil company. And I think it's a very bad sign that these union leaders have, have signed up indicating uh, their support uh, for that. And that's something uh, which should be uh, combated. I think, we, I think that's uh, all the things. Okay, thanks, Simon. Um, I've got uh, quite a few um, um, questions, uh, sort of on the question and answer on the chat line. So I'll, uh, I'll just go through those a uh, second. Uh, Bryn Jones asks, um, do you agree, Simon, that the post-COVID crisis in, for example, aviation offers a greater opportunity to retrain and reallocate workforces to green technologies and jobs? Mm -hmm. And he suggests that something like this could go to the labor policy review. Yeah. Um, a question which I think has been asked, asked before and you've responded in, in a number of ways. Um, addressing climate change and ecological collapse doesn't appear to be compatible with capitalism. Is there any hope that capitalism will collapse in time for the problem to be addressed? Um, that's one way of putting it, uh, Diana. Um, if so, would the collapse cause too much chaos to address anything? And that's actually quite an interesting point about, I suppose, uh, you know, w whether the, the, the chaos of capitalism will ultimately lead to a, a crisis that's irresolvable. Um, and then I, I, she adds a very cheerful remark, and I know that you're a, not a pessimistic person, 
but she says, does it look like humans are a non-viable species? Right, well, there's big questions there. Um, <laughs> and then um, I, I suppose it's a bit of a discussion, but it, there's a reference that Carol uh, Taylor Spedding makes, and I suppose she's, she's trying to link this idea of crisis, and she says about international cooperation, and I think that was quite a strong theme in the things that you were saying earlier, Simon, but maybe the international debt dimension here could be taken up. And then uh, one last question on transport policy, relating that to housing policy in particular, and I suppose this fits in with your idea of the suburb, that if people live close to where they work to new services, then would they need to, to travel around so much yeah. um, in that way? Yeah. So those are, those are a couple of the, um, those are a couple of the questions and I'll try and uh, bring a few more in um, just before we close. So if you could perhaps answer those. Okay, uh, thanks uh, very much. And uh, thanks to everybody for typing in the questions. I mean, I've, I've, come, to, I've come to have a real love-hate relationship with Zoom over the past couple of months. I'm <laughs> sure many of you have. It's such a, I, 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 you know, there's nothing more that I miss, you know, than uh, being able to go out and meet people and have a cup of coffee and, and sit in a meeting with friends and comrades and have the sort of discussion we're having and, and live football as well. Uh, it, 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 it's, uh, this, is, this is a really cruel kind of aspect to this COVID crisis that I think we all really need to be aware of. It's not just the economy, it's actually the way we socialise with each other. So anyway, thanks for uh, typing in your questions and everything and for being patient. I, I, it's really hard to concentrate as well, I think, uh, on Zoom for long uh, periods. Um, I hope me talking isn't any worse than other versions um so just starting at the last question transport and housing yeah i mean i found a figure in my book which is beloved of like urban uh policy experts which is that uh barcelona and atlanta in the southern united states have like the same kind of living standard the same sort of gdp per head the same population same sort of, you know, there's a, they're pretty much kind of similar size cities, except Atlanta is much more spread out. And uh, Atlanta has 11 times more greenhouse gas emissions per head of population than Barcelona. Now, are they 11 times happier? No, they are not. Uh, and so this just underlines the point uh, that uh, was made about transport and housing and, and yeah, how we design these cities. And I mean, I think one of the really criminal things uh, that's happened, one of the many criminal things under the Tory government, we've had a lot of campaigns here about housing. We're in a part of London where gentrification is uh, rushing along. And we've had a lot of people saying, hey, you know, we don't want to have two communities divided by one of the main roads in this area where all these uh, flats go up, which, you know, most local people can't afford with no social housing. But also the government has stopped the councils I mean, not that our council is the greatest, but the government has stopped councils from putting it in the planning regulations. You have to make this zero carbon. I mean, it's something that's so simple and it's something the construction industry doesn't like. So uh, it's how you design cities. And, you know, there are researchers who, who write about this. They're convinced you can have uh, zero carbon cities and so on. It's, it, it, I think, as I said before, it's a doddle. It's first year of architecture course at uh, university it's not complicated it's trickier retrofitting the old houses which of course uh, so many of us live in in the UK but you know people are there to get over tricky problems that's uh, that's what we should do um, international uh, cooperation uh, yes I mean I think it's really uh, I, I, I think how we uh, as we're learning to uh, tackle these issues in the global north and the sort of political demands we make as we're doing that if we fail to cooperate uh, with social movements and <clears throat> uh, communities in the global south i think we're in big uh, trouble uh, we have a, a, an extinction rebellion group here in southeast london in greenwich and um, we had uh, we had uh, asad raymond from war on want came to speak we have a, a monthly sort of forum sort of discussion thing uh, 
and Asad came, I thought he was absolutely terrific. I mean, he's been thinking about this for many years. Um, it's again, it's, you know, it's, not, it's not something that anyone's got any easy answers to. But I think, uh, you know, his take on this is, is really powerful and uh, worth listening to. And, and uh, there are other organisations um, who have thought a great deal about this. And I think that's absolutely uh, fundamental. Um, does it look like uh, humans are a... Um, oh, hang on, before I get to that one, before I get to the cheerful one, um, <laughs> The green policy and post-COVID, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I do actually think aviation has taken a real hammering. And, you know, speaking to my colleagues at the Institute where I work in Oxford, and they're people who are mostly much more well disposed to uh, working with oil companies and so on than I would naturally be. And, uh, you know, our work and, and the, the research is sponsored by those companies, they, they customarily go around the world in planes and they've all just stopped. And uh, I don't see it starting. I mean, that's just one institute, but I mean, obviously, that, that I think that's very, very, very widespread. I think, you know, also the oil company managers that uh, we do the presentations for and so on. I mean, they're people who are used to jumping on a plane every week. Now it's stopped. And I, I think aviation won't come back in the same way. And thank goodness. But also the aviation companies will fight back. We'll see. I mean, they'll be the first in line. We'll see how a fossil fuel driven industry fights back and tries to keep its toehold. They've already had promises from Trump. They seem to be getting them from Johnson and uh, we'll see where else uh, they get them from. So, the, you know, these are the kind of fights uh, that are coming up. Now getting to this, um, I, I mean, I, I, so going back to real, the point I made in the presentation um, where I look at this history of the uh climate talks i mean actually it, yeah it makes it it brings up a really gloomy picture and i think if we don't ask ourselves the question that somebody's asked there you know does it look like humans are actually a non-viable species i mean i think we're actually not being serious i think it is a fair question um i think humanity collectively has managed to uh mess up this relationship with nature in a kind of fairly fundamental way and i think i mean it's very clear from our conversation um and uh what we've been talking about that i i share i think with all of you the the belief that that is largely due to the form of social organization the fact that we we live in a capitalist society and so on but nonetheless it does kind of raise that question are all these contradictions going to be so difficult for society to deal with that um it's going to collapse. Well, I, I, I don't know what collapse means. I think if you went to Syria or to Gaza or to Yemen or to Congo and talk to people about collapse, they'd say, hey, where have you been for the last 20 years? We, we know all about that. That's happened in the past tense. Uh, I think, you know, we've seen these wildfires and floods and so on that happened last year and the way that uh, these ecological effects, which are definitely connected with climate change, can be visited on communities. What I think is that uh, these effects will multiply. I think they will get bigger. I think that capitalism will always seek to force the consequences of climate change onto the poorest. I think, I mean, it sounds bad to sit again in a relatively com comfortable position in the global north and say this, um, but um, I think that capitalism will, will, will try to force this onto the poorest. I think what will not happen uh, is you get some kind of Hollywood movie style collapse. There's quite a few books out there about so-called social collapse. And there's actually a very popular, uh, an article which is very popular uh, in amongst the people who are in Extinction Rebellion or some of them by this guy, Jem Bendel, um, who's a, 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 I think he was an environmental uh, researcher and he kind of you know he, he sort of had a long hard think and he sort of thought my goodness this is actually a hell of a lot worse than all this sustainability stuff that I'm working on uh, allows for and he went through this kind of conversion and he wrote this article which is which is kind of grim and pessimistic and takes all the most uh, grim uh, predictions of climate science and kind of says these are going to happen but he doesn't really have he doesn't really have any answers that are collectivist that are community-based that talk about humanity and society working together. Um, 
it almost sort of comes down to the prospect of, you know, how are you going to protect yourself when your neighbours turn on each other and everything gets violent and so on. I mean, I'm sorry, that, that I'm not saying it can't ever happen. Um, and of course, in certain situations, it has happened. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I kind of do have a belief in uh, the ability of human beings to act together. Uh, I'd strongly recommend the book by uh, Rebecca Solnit, the American journalist who actually looked at various disasters. So I think she started with New Orleans, the, the big floods there, and some of the other earthquakes and different things, which are, are, are probably not, some of them were connected with climate change, but also kind of natural disasters uh, and the way that people are affected. And I mean, her research showed very kind of convincingly, and she, she's looked at the academic research and so on, um, that uh, society, when the back is to the wall, people generally respond collectively and protect each other in a way that they perhaps wouldn't even Im have imagined they could have done. Uh, and I mean, I think we've seen kind of glimpses of that with COVID, with the way people have called in uh, on their elderly neighbours and, and uh, looked after the homeless people in their communities and so on. So, you know, we're seeing it in real time, right? Uh, COVID is not separate from this. The sort of crisis we've lived through and the devastating effects on homeless people and, and people have spoken about, I think somebody said, you know, what happens when the, 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 the money runs out and they start uh, unemployment and so on starts up in a big way. Yes, I mean, I do, I do think we're headed for uh, a, a, a really uh, dangerous uh, economic situation. But I, I, yeah, I think history shows, and not only this book by Solnit, there's plenty of other examples. I mean, people are able to stick together and are able to act as communities. And I think in a way, I mean, these of course were part of the founding principles of the labor movement that we all uh, believe in and, and I think are finding our way back to in many ways uh, in this uh, situation. Um, last, last point, uh, Kevin, it's just something I spotted on the chat. I, I, I've, I've, I've probably, if you've put a point in the chat and uh, I haven't answered it, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a completely accessible person, simonvirani at gmail.com. Uh, you'll find that on the internet. It's, you know, please send me an email. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to duck anything. But one thing, one thing I'm, I'm annoyed about, which I've seen in the chat, I'm annoyed about, I'm annoyed by the mention of, uh, I, and please don't take offense if it's you that, you that said it. I'm not annoyed at you. I'm annoyed at uh, Michael Moore for supporting that film called, uh, I've forgotten what it was called, Planet of the Humans. Um, and I just... So I, all I want to say about that, I'm not annoyed at anybody here. I'm annoyed at Michael Moore. And the reason I'm annoyed is I think that as a movement, as social movements, as a labor movement, we can do so much better than that stupid film. And it's stupid for two reasons. One, the people they've got talking about renewable technology don't really know what they're talking about. And two, which is, which is an absolute condemnation, he's got this procession of, you know, white Northern academics talking about population and the need and that you know what really comes out of this is that we need to have less population they don't specify what kind of people there should be less of but mm. you know there's a long long history of this in first world uh, mm. environmentalism and i don't know what michael moore is thinking uh, giving his support to such a poor film I, I mean the discussion about renewables it's posed as an either or it's either renewables uh, built by big energy companies, which guess what? Our socialists don't like big energy companies. Hey, we can do things a different way. We can do things better. It's not an either or, renewables or coal. You know, there's, 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 or renewables done by big energy companies and coal. There's better ways out of this, which we've been talking about all evening. And the other thing is populationism. And I, I, uh, I, I, I've, I have a very kind of checkered attitude to George Monbiot, who it really blows hot and cold for me. I think he's got much better with, with the school students and so on being out on the streets. He seems to have found a bit of a, uh, a socialistic vibe occasionally and, uh, you know, going on the late night t telly, talking about revolution and everything. I thought his article on the film, actually, to be fair to him, and I, 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 you, you could tell me about other articles of his I'd be very critical of, but I think his article about the film is well worth having a, having a read of. I thought he, he put this point about populationism just being completely... Uh, should be for us, for our movement, completely uh, something that we, we reject. Otherwise, how are we going to build that alliance with uh, those movements in the global south who know damn well what's being suggested uh, when uh, ideas of controlling and limiting population are discussed?
So, um, yeah, we can just do better than the film. I mean, watch it it's on the internet. <laughs> I'm sure you've got better things to watch. Okay, thanks, Simon. Uh, I'm just going to take uh, maybe another round of uh, questioners, and I think I've got uh, Harry Hutchinson, and I think Alan Gibson may also be wanting to come in again, but I'll just take uh, Harry first of all. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, I was going to refer to the film The Planet of the Humans <laughs> by Michael Muir, and um, I know you've quite rubbished it, Simon, um, but he, point, he points out, <laughs> that was timing, wasn't it? Um, he points out two things in the film documentary. And the first thing is, is that he points out how the corporations themselves have taken, according to the documentary, almost full control over the greenhouse agenda currently, that they're in control of it. And to give an example, of just how much they've protected the fossil fuels in the program of the renewable energy is take, for example, wind power. We can argue whether it's a good or bad alternative, but he points out in the film that in the making of these wind turbines, it uses up a serious amount of oil and no doubt other fossil fuels in the making of them. So in other words, although it's a, it seems a fairly creditable alternative, it doesn't do anything at all to reduce fossil fuel emissions. And uh, that may indeed be a very clever initiative coming from the corporations because they appear to be moving forward, but in fact are in fact protecting their, their industry itself. Um, I mean, the... The Pew, the Pew Institute in America pointed out very recently that in the next 40 years, a fossil fuel emissions will have dropped roughly about 5%, which is minuscule. And we're going full steam ahead to a dramatic increase, of course, by the end of the century of serious problems in our, in our environment. And secondly, um, when you have it's, it's all right for one country to perhaps take, um, like some of the Scandinavian countries for, uh, have taken quite, quite large procedures in, in moving away from transport and so on to, in, in cars. But the biggest two emission, emissions come from China and the US. And they're continually, China in particular, is continually to build um, coal-fired power stations and so on at still quite an alarming rate. The, the question really is what we have to address, is I know you've rubbished the film, but I think it points out a number of important points. The fact is we haven't really found the technology yet to really replace fossil fuels. It's not there. I know you've gone through alternatives, what we need to do, getting people um, um, uh, uh, homes that are better insulated, uh, people using less energy, um, maybe in the next while we might even see electric planes, which would be a contribution. But the simple fact is, even for ourselves as an environment, we haven't found the answer. We haven't found the real answer as an alternative. And what we're faced with in the next 20 to 40 years is really much more, more of the same. And you're saying, I think what you're saying and some of the answers you've given is the technology's there, but still not found. This is the serious problem I think we're faced with. We still don't know the answer that's going to seriously undermine an alternative to fossil fuel. Okay. Thank okay, thank you, Harry. And uh, Alan Gibson. Can you, are you through, Alan? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I. I I think I agree with what Mari was trying to say, or at least what I understood by what she was trying to say. Uh, in terms of technology, on a big problem we have is the vast amount of scientific and other human resource which is wasted uh, under capitalism. Yeah. Um, obviously, the big one is the military, um, but also all the mindless advertising to convince ourselves that products which are actually the same are different, um, that we have to buy something new all the time, that planned obsolescence is a good thing and all that all the waste 
um, not, not even to consider the wasted human potential uh, in the global south um, who had to struggle just to get by, let alone to be able to think about um, making significant changes. Um, so the, I don't think, I, I think degrowth in the um, global north is going to be necessary. Um, but, and I, I do have confidence that humanity has the potential to come up with technology if we can free up um, this as the thing we're primarily concerned about. But it's not really a technological question. It's primary, primarily about social relations. And those need to be fundamentally transformed. I mean, the, the idea that we can deal with the size of this crisis, even if we were to um, somehow cut CO2 emissions to zero tomorrow, the amount of um, carbon that's in the atmosphere and the um, level of collapse that is already locked in um, is, is massive. And we're going to need a huge social transformation to deal with that alone, let alone with trying to um, change society so that we do get emissions down and can get through uh, the period of um, collapse, which, as Simon points to, is actually here. I mean, Syria, um, some people have argued that Syria actually was partially the result of um, climate change through the extended drought, which preceded the uh, rebellion. Um, but I think it's clear that, th that there's no way that humanity can deal with a, making the changes of this uh, magnitude while we have primate ownership of the processes of production, distribution and exchange. That, that's just incompatible with what is required. The decision, the massive decisions that are made by the big corporations which will rule our world um, behind closed doors in the, um, with the consideration of short-term profit and capital accumulation, that's completely counterposed to what's necessary um, to avert the coming catastrophe. So, uh, so that's a big thing. And, and obviously the short time frame, um, 10 years is talked about, maybe as Simon mentioned at one point, um, no one knows exactly. Um, things do meet, seem to be getting worse faster than the scientists were predicting. So that's not a good thing, but we don't know exactly how long we've got. But it seems to me that, and it's also unclear how we're gonna get there and it, what a future society which was sustainable and was more democratic and was more rational would exactly look like. But I think that where we are now, a first important step is a political struggle to create an environmental movement which is um, explicitly anti-capitalist. Now, anti-capitalist might mean different things to different people, but still um, an environmental movement which projects the ideas of Green New Deals, uh, where there um, can be trust in a green capitalism of whatever form that is, because um, that's just a fantasy. And that that's the essential first step, um, which I think the political activists should be trying to do. I mean, that's something I'm trying to do on a small scale here in Cork with uh, I've basically left Extinction Rebellion because they weren't having that. Their whole model is to make the capitalists be nice capitalists um, through moral pressure. Um, so I think as activists, that's very important. And within the Labour Party, I think for the people here in the Labour Party, I think you've got a big problem because the Labour Party is, as Simon pointed out, not willing to um, attack the basis of capitalism. Finish. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Alan. And um, just one last contributor, Mark Metcalf. Okay, Mark, can you come, please? Mark? Sorry, I have to make him first into a yeah. co-host. Mark, can you just switch on your camera now, please? I'm trying to do that. I'm hoping I'm doing that. Um, mm, I've got a bit of a mess on here. Oh, yes, I have. My apologies. Right. My apologies. I wasn't uh, originally trying to suggest that we should be burning more coal in essence. What I was suggesting and trying to propose in what I was saying is that the miners were open to uh, radical social change. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is because uh, I've had 
conversations with people who were involved in Extinction Rebellion. And they view the miners as a backward uh, uh, group of people. They view the North very often as a backward group of people. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge division uh, between, between those, uh, the, the old, as you would say, the older group of working class people fighting for radical social change and the new group, which are often partially working class, but also London based very much a Southeast thing. So there's a cultural divide. And I think it's important to recognize that and to not play into that. And one of the things I like about the fact that people were fighting for carbon capture and storage in the 70s and 80s, and were also engaging in discussions with Friends of the Earth, is that historical content breaks that down. It actually says it, it's, a, it's a breakdown. I'm not suggesting, but also I am suggesting that as coal is going to be burnt, then it would be logical to suggest that carbon capture and storage should be something that people should consider. That would be my view. I have to say, and I had this argument, I had this argument with some of the senior officials in the Labour Party, the Green New Deal was a technological solution. However, we, are, we live in a country with the exception of Spain, where basically most of the land is owned by a handful of people, okay? And that's an issue which the left has historically ignored. And that is meant that, in fact, we don't have control of that land. Now, what was the biggest outbreak of uh, rebellion that took place at the start of the, uh, the Tory and Liberal government? There were two. There was the trade union one against pensions and the rest. And the other one was around forestry, the sending off of the forests. That was a huge social campaign which invited Unite and activists, okay, and that's the sort of uh, breakdown which we want. We want to, when we say Green Deal, we, it has to include agriculture. It has to include uh, planting more trees. It has to include taking on the uh, large landowners who are burning the moors at this time, just for pure pleasure, which are being subsidized. Now, if we are going to spend money, of course, I want rid of capitalism. Uh, you know, and I'll, I'll argue that, okay. But in the meantime, I also want to put forward ideas that basically I think might have some resonance amongst working class people. And some of those ideas should be, don't spend the money on this. Don't give it to large landowners, give it to, to, to the creation of jobs in rural communities and in working class communities. And that's vital also for the South, in my view. We can grow more food, we can end the dominance of some of the supermarkets, and it doesn't mean that people have to transport their own food to feed us. Now, I live in a working class community in Halifax, and one of the things that has really happened in the last three to four months is how many people have done up their gardens. We're not back to the sheds and the crees of what used to happen in in the, in the town I was from, Easton and Peter Lee, where working class lads who worked in the pit came home and they had pigeon sheds, they had they had their chickens, they had the thing because they loved doing that. They grew their own food and they grew some of their own meat. Now, that happens in places like Russia. It still continues to happen. And those are some of the solutions at least we can offer on a local level whilst arguing on an international level that we need to stop burning coal. We need to stop going all over the world. So I, I didn't, the only reason I've come back on is I didn't want you to think I'm suggesting that coal is the solution to this problem. I'm not, uh, I wasn't suggesting that. So my apologies for that. But those are my points. The Green Deal has to include the issues of food. It has to include the issues of farming. And in this country, it has to include the issue of land ownership. Thanks for your time. Okay, thanks very much, Mark. Okay, Simon, if you'd uh, like to just sum up now. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, well, starting with that last uh, point that Mark's made, and uh, I mean, I completely agree with you about agriculture. I completely agree with you about the need to disentangle and dismantle this industrial agriculture, this international industrial agriculture system, um, where uh, in Latin America you get these huge uh, farming areas which are given over to beef. The beef is uh, 
sent to North America. Uh, it's fed to teenagers in the form of hamburgers and uh, they uh, begin to suffer obesity. It's a, it's a very unhealthy diet for them. And of course, the people in the South in uh, Latin America are also not eating properly because they're not eating for reasons of poverty. I mean, I complete, so I, yes, I completely agree that that is absolutely part of this. I, I agree with what uh, Mark has said on that, and yes, about land in this country. I completely agree with you, Mark, as well about uh, the cultural divide. I think that's really, uh, I mean, you know, I, I think Extinction Rebellion is a very mixed uh, bunch. Uh, to the group we've got here in, in the locality where I am, you know, they're basically a lovely group of, of people. They are mostly middle class, they're mostly white, and they're very aware of that. And they, they try really hard to kind of think about that and how to change that and how they relate to other people and so on. Um, I think that uh, one of the good things that's happened is in Scotland, there's been some working together of Extinction Rebellion who've tried to approach oil workers, they've worked with the trade unions and so on, uh, on the issue of just transition from North Sea. I think there's very interesting things happening up there. There's an organization uh, which is mainly sort of trade union activists, it's called Scott E3. If you have a little search around on the internet, I can't remember if it's Scott.E3 or Scott underscore E3 or whatever, anyway, and there's been a number of meetings and everything they've organized. I think they're really blazing the trail in quite an important way, organizing important discussions about these very issues uh, that we've talked about tonight. And I mean, I think that was completely missing in the 80s in the coal industry. Look, there, were, the, the, there, there was no discussion of that kind. It, 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 it was just like the Tories are coming and trying to destroy the industry and destroy the people in it and destroy the trade union. That was their uh, strategical aim. Uh, I, I completely agree with you, Mark, that miners were open to radical social change and, of course, understood it in a probably a much richer way than perhaps, uh, you know, somebody who's left university and suddenly taken it into their head to join Extinction Rebellion and hasn't lived um, that same experience. But, you know, yeah, all these experiences are, are, are relevant and the movement has to be about, obviously, overcoming these barriers. And I think there's great uh, opportunities to do that. I, I think... It, <laughs> A very, a very sad episode I remember was when you mentioned Dave Douglas before and he went down with Arthur Scargill to the uh, power station down near here in Kent, the uh, King's North power station, because there was a big environmental demonstration down there. And I, I mean, I wasn't there, but I had I talked to a number of people afterwards. And I mean, it was the two sides weren't listening to each other. Um, uh, Arthur was never the greatest at listening to the other side if he was putting his point over in a certain way and I don't think the environmentalists were listening either and I mean I just think it was uh, uh, but you know look that was 10-12 years ago now we can do better now and actually up in the northeast what we've seen is the you know very interesting I think it's just a little I think it's a little I'm not going to argue that it's the answer to all our problems but I think it's a little sign of where we are they decided that some bright sparks decided they were going to set up a company and they were going to do this horrible, dirty process called underground coal gasification, where basically you suck the methane, which the methane is what used to blow up and coal, kill coal miners, right? The idea was to suck that methane out of the coal. Methane is natural gas. Suck it out, capture it, and take it to the surface and use it. And it's called, but it's filthy. They, the only other place they've been talking about doing it is Uzbekistan and they've dropped it. So they were going to do this in Tisa. Anyway, a committee was formed of women locally and basically they told this company to go and get knotted. And they said, oh, you know, we're going to create local jobs. And, they, you know, mate, you're 30 years too late. The question of jobs around here was settled a long time ago and people had to find their ways around it. These were the same women who'd been active in Women Against Pit Closures. So they just said to this company, don't come to our community and start telling us about jobs now and think we're going to, you know, involve, be involved in this dirty, dangerous process for your sake. So I, I think anyway, I think that's a, I mean, you, you talk to them, they're over at Teesside. I just think that's a, a little glimpse that we're, you know, we're moving on. Um, so quickly on, um, I, mean, I, I, I don't disagree with anything, uh, Alan, you said uh, uh, the need to, create a different kind of movement. I, I don't quite know how to do that. You're, you're doing whatever works in court. I'm doing what hopefully is somehow going to work in Greenwich. Um, just coming on to the point uh, Harry uh, has raised. So I just think about the technology, the, I mean, the point that was wrong in the film, it is incorrect 
to say it is wrong to say that wind turbines use the same amount of uh, fossil fuels as taking the fossil fuels and putting them in a power station and producing electricity. It's just wrong. It's also not true. It, it, we don't have to believe the green advertising from, you know, big uh, wind businesses that this is completely green technology, also rubbish. But it is true, you know, any engineer, you know, and, I mean, the reason to plane, even to somebody like me who's not an engineer, look, once you've built your wind turbine, however you do it, and that's a big question, and I'm absolutely not for pretending that the minerals come out of thin air. They don't. They come out of countries where people live. And we know the conditions under which they're mined, and uh, we don't like them, right? So that's not a neutral question. But nevertheless, once you've built a wind turbine, however you do it, right, you're basically getting your electricity for no extra cost and for, no, for burning, you know, no fuels, basically, uh, as you are with a nuclear power station. You know, once you've got the thing up and running and you've got your uranium, which also is not easy, you're producing it for, for, for no extra uh, fossil fuel burn. Of course, you've got a massive problem of nuclear waste. You've got a massive problem of the military. That's why I would prefer the wind turbines solar as well. I mean, if you can work out a way of getting solar heat, you know, in the Middle East, you look out over the roofs. I mean, people have got, uh, they, they're using solar water heaters. There's no technology there. It's simple. You put the water on the roof and it heats up. Um, so, you know, all kinds of technologies, and there are solar technologies and there are wind technologies which use, and the scientists who've done, they do these, uh, um, what are they called, uh, uh, sort of end-to-end -end studies, where they, t life cycle emission studies, sorry, the sort of uh, a brain thing there, it's getting to nine o'clock. Um, so uh, yeah, they do life cycle emission studies, which show you, you know, if you, if you, you know, if you built a load of wind turbines and ran them for 20 years, or you built a coal fired power station, they do all the sums, they have fantastic arguments about it, they come out with the answer. The answer is you lose much, 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 much less resources of all kinds with wind turbines. I am not an advertising agency for big wind, or big corporations who own wind. Uh, it is, I, don't, I wouldn't agree. I think, Harry, I, 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 I take your points. I think, I think saying they've taken control of the agenda is a little strong in the sense that I think, you know, of course they always try to take control of the agenda. Car companies try to take control of that agenda. Aviation companies try to take control, but I don't think they always get there. And I think it, it's a more disputed agenda uh, than the film uh, allows it for. Um, I, I think I think the film made some fair points actually about some of the big environmentalist NGOs who have got a history of kind of cuddling up to companies that they think are doing better than other companies. I, that's really, you know, I wouldn't want to be involved in all that. I think that's a, a bad way to do things. Um, you know, I think our movement is big and broad enough that we can focus on building up the opposition and not get too tied down with all that. And I don't, I, I, I don't agree with you. Um, Harry, that uh, we haven't, I, I suppose we haven't worked out all the answers. You said we haven't, you know, we haven't um, found the technology to replace fossil fuels. No, not totally, no. But, you know, the human race is a, you know, we're an ingenious bunch in many ways, um, very, very resourceful. And if all that, I mean, what I think the point is the one that Alan made, that the wasted human potential, if that was all being put to do, it's like we were we were talking about the Silvertown Tunnel thing that we got down here in South East London the other day, and uh, we were saying, look, if you put all and it, because one of the arguments from the Great London Authority is, oh, you know, it's a it's a PFI, a, a private finance initiative, so we're not using the TFL's money, and we're <laughs> and we're saying, yeah, but you know, look at the thousands of person hours. Why don't you put all those people in TFL into inventing some proper bike lanes and not these stupid white lines where you driving along and you've got a lorry up your backside and they're absolutely no use whatsoever and and you know invent some proper car free streets and invent some proper public transport put all that brain power and creative power into that and i think you know you can magnify that to a bigger scale if if as alan said if, if the wasted human potential was put to solving these problems i think you know we, we there are technologies windmills and solar panels are just the most obvious ones when there are lots of other ones and i, I think the the, the point that uh, has also been made, you know, reducing demand, not by sitting in the dark, but by, you know, finding different ways of using energy 
I mean, that's a very, very big um, item. I think, uh, I think I've at least tried to answer all the questions, but again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm right here. I'm on the end of an email and uh, it's been uh, really great talking uh, to everybody and, and don't hesitate to come back to me if uh, there's any more I can tell you. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Simon, and uh, thanks to all the contributors as well. Um, we will be putting this up, I think, on Facebook and on the uh, uh, Labour Left Alliance website, so you can get more information about this, and also a number of other talks that we've uh, been doing over the last couple of weeks. So I'd like to thank everybody for taking part, and uh, I hope to see you again or indeed to take part in the discussion again at one of our meetings that are coming up in the next couple of weeks. So uh, thanks very much, and I'll talk to you soon.